Subcommittee on Technology, Information Policy, Intergovernmental Relations and Procurement Reform will come to order. Subcommittee meets today to consider H.R. 373, the Unfunded Mandates Information and Transparency Act of 2011. Subcommittee will now consider H.R. 373, the Unfunded Mandates Information and Transparency Act of 2011, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. This year, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is focused on technology, grant reform, intergovernmental relationships. While we have significant work left to do in oversight, today is a culmination of numerous hearings related to the Federal role in relationship with non-Federal entities. The tone throughout the three hearings related to the unfunded mandates has been bipartisan and open. In fact, President Obama's Chief Regulatory Officer, Cass Sunstein, has called the Committee's efforts constructive and important. Today's subcommittee markup of H.R. 373, the Unfunded Mandates Information and Transparency Act of 2011, continues that important work. Starting in February, this subcommittee began studying the effectiveness of the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, also known as UMRA. We have held three legislative hearings and made inqu inquiries into the Congressional Budget Office and the Administration's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, that is OIRA, concerning various UMRA provisions and possible improvements. UMRA was enacted in 1995 to shed light on the expected economic impact of proposed legislation and regulations on state, local, tribal governments, and the private sector. UMRA was an essential new step to help inform Congress about the potential burden of these mandates so they could be weighed against the potential benefits. However, during the subcommittee's hearings, we have heard from representatives of state and local governments and the private sector that many undocumented and burdensome unfunded mandates are slipping through the cracks in the UMRA statute. And the heavy burden of many regulations is not fully captured on the analysis required under UMRA. Indeed, in the past 10 years, only four rules issued by Federal agencies have been classified as, as <laughs> as consisting of unfunded mandates on State, local, and our tribal governments. Further, only 13 of 66 major rules issued in 2010 were classified as unfunded mandates. Only one of these 13 was identified as an intergovernmental mandate. Even the President has stated, sometimes rules have gotten out of balance, placing unreasonable burdens on businesses, burdens that have stifled innovation and have had a chilling effect in growth and on jobs. He recently made an even stronger statement, telling a joint session of Congress that we should have no more regulation than the health, safety, and security of the American people require. Every rule should meet that common sense test. With this backdrop, it is appropriate we reform UMRA, not only in the context of state, local, and tribal government mandates, but also with regard to those affecting the private sector. The Chief Economist at the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council at our hearing in March stated that unfunded mandates and regulations continually stifle private sector growth and economic expansion. To help ensure every rule meets President Obama's common sense test, it is time to close the various loopholes, exemptions, and exceptions to UMRA, which this subcommittee learned about during its hearings. Therefore, H.R. 373 will be marked up today. H.R. 373 is a bipartisan bill that was introduced in the 111th Congress and was resubmitted in the 112th Congress. It also has the support of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, and the National Conference of State Legislatures. H.R. 373 allows UMRA to label more unfunded mandates by removing the exemption for independent regulatory agencies and requiring cost estimates for conditions of grant aid. Under H.R. 373, Federal agencies in the Congressional Budget Office will be required to estimate the direct and indirect costs of a Federal mandate. Finally, H.R. 373 requires agencies to adhere to UMRA's requirements even if the agency did not issue a notice of proposed rulemaking. I have stated before and will state again, making these reforms is not attack, an attack on the current administration. Many of the issues that we will deal with today did not originate during this administration, and the solutions we propose will extend well beyond this administration. It is essential that we look at the bigger picture and the long-term effects of our Federal involvement in State, local, tribal governments and private business operation. But it is also essential that each agency is evaluated on results, not rhetoric. It is the role and responsibility of the subcommittee and Congress as a whole to ensure that regulations are consistent with legislative intent and they are written in such a way to cause the least amount of burden for the greatest possible benefit. It is my goal to make certain that in this modern regulatory environment, Washington does not overstep its clearly defined constitutional boundaries and well-intentioned Federal employees do not impose their preferences on State, local, and tribal governments in the private sector. Marking up the legislation before us today and sending it to full committee will put us one step closer to achieving this goal, and I look forward to our conversation today and seeing the eventual passage of this important bill. I would um, ask unanimous consent that the letters of support referenced in my opening statement be entered in the record without objection, so ordered. Mr. Connolly, would you like to make an opening statement? I would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we have had uh, numerous hearings on unfunded mandates and regulations in our subcommittee and at the full committee level. While we agree about the need to protect local and State governments from unwarranted unfunded mandates, 
I cannot endorse wholesale changes to regulatory policy under the guise of reforming unfunded mandates. At the last full committee hearing, one witness invited by the majority criticized Federal agencies for implementing new regulations to prevent cross-border shipment of non-native pythons and other snakes. As you know, scientists have found that a warming climate means that snakes such as the Burmese python and boa constrictors will be able to move farther north, threatening human safety, agricultural productivity and ecosystem integrity far beyond the Everglades. Given the devastating impact of non-native snake species in the Everglades, it would seem appropriate for Federal agencies under the 111-year-old Lacey Act to protect other parts of the country by restricting importation of dangerous snake species. Unfortunately, such common sense regulations which be, would be much harder to issue if this bill were to be passed as written and amended by your amendment in the nature of a substitute. This bill would tie up Federal agencies with massive quantities of red tape imposing duplicative reporting and analytic requirements to issue simple public safety regulations. For example, the Fish and Wildlife Service would have to report on whether there are user fees or marketable permits would work in lieu of regulation. Agencies already are required to analyze costs and benefits of proposed regulations. Agencies are already required to solicit, analyze and respond to public comments, including from entities that would be subject to such regulation. The additional analysis and reporting requirements in this bill would simply delay issuance of regulations, which, of course, is the intent. In some cases, those delays would be absurd. Do we really think the Fish and Wildlife Service should consider the establishment of a marketable permit for invasive snakes? I told the majority I could support the original UMRA Information and Transparency Act with two simple changes, replace the term indirect costs with net costs, and acknowledge the difference between unfunded mandates on state and local governments and regulations of the private sector for the public interest. The majority not only rejected those changes, but added red tape to the bill as it appears before us today. Even though CBO has told staff it cannot analyze the nebulous and direct costs identified in this bill, the bill still requires it of them. This bill even gives a single member of Congress the authority to compel an agency to conduct retrospective analyses of regulations which surely would divert important agency resources at a time of shrinking Federal budgets and add costs. Most fundamentally, this bill fails even to recognize that regulations can save money. For example, according to the Congressional Research Service, the pending cross-state air pollution control rule could save as much as $280 billion per year by reducing health care costs with a 350 to 1 benefit cost to ratio. Why would we ignore one side of the equation by only looking at the costs but never at the benefits of proposed regulation? The answer is that this majority has an inflexible ideological commitment to dismantling many of the institutions we cherish. Tomorrow we will delay or repeal some dozen environmental regulations, including limits on soot, smog and mercury. Within the last month, we repealed part of the Wagner Labor Relations Act. The bill before us today would impede the ability of the Securities and Exchange Commission the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, among others, to police Wall Street after the worst meltdown in 80 years. In short, the Republican agenda would return America to the law of the jungle. With their failure to address global warming and proposals to deregulate interstate state commerce, at least they are consistent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Cummings, I understand you have an opening statement. I would be honored to be able to receive it now. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, be blunt. This committee uh, should be focused on creating jobs. I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but I will repeat what I have been saying all year. Uh, my constituents tell me that we need to find common ground and higher ground and pass concrete bipartisan proposals to create jobs. The bill we are considering today will not create one single job, not one. The, and it is interesting that this afternoon we will be addressing the postal system and its problems and we will place probably tens of thousands of, of people who have worked so hard for so long to basically be laid off. What this bill will do is add barriers to the rulemaking process that will tie up Federal agencies and make it harder for them to pass rules 
that protect the health of our children, your constituents and mine, the safety of our food, the quality of our water and air, and our national security. I have said it from this dais many times that we can erode from the inside. We can be destroyed from the inside by not taking care of our people, by not educating them, by not taking care of their health, welfare and safety. Another argument that is often made about regulations is uncertainty. As Mr. Connolly has pointed out, from what I can see, this adds even more uncertainty. It drags out the process. And so any legislation aimed at improving the regulatory process should take a very balanced approach. The substitute amendment that the majority plans to offer today fails, unfortunately, to meet that standard. And it pains me to even be saying this. It significantly expands the requirements on agencies under the Unfended Mandates Reform Act, gives industries an unfair advantage in rulemaking process, expand judicial review, which will tie up agencies in court and cause judges to second-guess agency experts. What kind of predictability does that provide? I am disappointed in the approach the majority has taken to this markup. This markup was originally scheduled for, June, for August 4th. That was 49 days ago. Yet the minority members of the subcommittee were not provided a copy of the majority substitute amendment until Monday. The substitute amendment makes significant changes to the bill, rendering it a new bill entirely. Uh, this is not the way we should do business, Mr. Chairman. We should work together to, to craft bipartisan legislation that incorporates input from both sides of the committee. And I go back to this whole issue of being able to predict what is going on with regard to business people. Yesterday in one of my other roles as a member of the Joint Economic Committee, Dr. Alan Meltzer, um, a witness called by the majority, uh, he is a professor of political science at, and economy at Carnegie Mellon University. He said something that was very interesting. He said, you know, it is important that we have this predictability, but whatever it is going to be, he, he even talked about the Clinton, um, when Clinton raised, the, raised taxes and added 22 million jobs. He said one of the main reasons why that happened is because when people were able to predict, and that is business people were able to predict what their taxes were going to be. And he talked and he said that we, if we are going to do uh, regulating, um, we need to do it in a very balanced fashion. It was a very interesting testimony, and it made a lot of sense. And I am just saying that uh, if we are going to do this, Let's not add more burdens. And, 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 and the one thing I am glad about, Mr. Chairman, to give you maximum credit, you did give the President of the United States, President Barack Obama, credit for what he has done. You did make it clear that all these regulations are not just his. They have been coming on for many years. And I think we ought to continuously make it clear that this President has done more probably than any other President in recent history to address this issue. And with that, I yield back and thank the Chairman for his courtesy. Thank you. And I will hold the record open until the end of the day for any members who would like to submit a written statement. We will now open the bill H.R. 373 for consideration without objection. H.R. 373 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is at each, in each of your folders. Uh, the clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 373, a bill to amend the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995 to ensure that actions taken by regulatory agencies are subject to that act and for other purposes. I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The amendment has been distributed. Without objection, the amendment will be considered read in the original text for the purposes of an amendment. My amendment in the nature of a substitute retains all the provisions of H.R. 373 and strengthens the legislation by adopting further UMR reforms recommended at the subcommittee's hearings. To be clear, we did not write the amendment in the nature of a substitute and then have hearings. 
we held hearings to listen and inform the legislation around many of the ideas that were heard during those hearings. The ANS allows UMRA to, to label more unfunded mandates by removing the exemption for conditions of Federal assistance and duties arising from participation in voluntary Federal programs and aligns the cost set threshold with Executive Order 12866, issued by President Clinton, reaffirmed by President Bush, and reaffirmed by President Obama. The ANS requires Federal agencies to be consistent and to consult with the private sector in the development of significant regulatory mandates, just like they already do for State, local, and tribal government mandates. The ANS allows the Chairman of any standing committee to request that a Federal agency conduct a retrospective cost analysis of an existing Federal mandate to learn of any changes in the cost of the regulatory environment, and that also includes the ranking member of any committee. The ANS extends judicial review to help ensure agencies carefully consider the least costly, least burdensome regulatory alternatives. The ANS permits a point of order to be raised if a legislative mandate exceeds the UMRA threshold. Finally, the ANS formally aligns the regulatory authority from the Office of Management and Budget to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which is standard practice already today. Many of the things that we are actually adding into this amendment to the nature of the substitute are things that are currently uh, practiced in 12866, that executive order. They just don't exist in legislative language. They only exist in the, leg in the executive order itself. The administration has said they are strongly supportive of UMRA. I am glad that we are here to make UMRA even stronger. I'm does any member wish to speak on this bill? Does any member wish to offer an amendment? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, will we read the amendment? Designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 373 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment strikes the language in Section 5 of the amendment, which requires the Director of the Congressional Budget Office to prepare and submit to the Committee of Jurisdiction a statement of the reasonably foreseeable indirect costs of any unfunded mandate. This provision is problematic for several reasons, one being that we do not know how or if CBO would comply with this requirement, since indirect costs are very difficult, if not impossible, to quantify. In addition, this provision creates an undue burden on CBO that already a substantial amount of work attempting to score bills that actually have concrete and readily available costs associated with them. It is my understanding yesterday the Director of the Congressional Budget Office, Doug Elmendorf, called the Committee to express his concerns with this provision of the legislation. And with that, I would move the amendment. Do other members wish to um, comment on this amendment? Mr. Cummings. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support this amendment. The Director of the Congressional Budget Office called my staff yesterday to express his deep concerns with this provision of the bill. In all my years in Congress, now 16, I do not believe the Director of the CBO has called my staff directly to express such concern about a piece of legislation. The amendment in the nature of a substitute does not include a clear definition of reasonably foreseeable indirect costs. Instead, it says the following. The term reasonably, reasonably foreseeable indirect costs with respect to a Federal mandate means costs to the affected entities resulting from the implementation of the mandate other than the direct costs incurred by such entities to carry out the mandate. It goes on to say, and B, includes lost income and secondary monetary costs resulting from the mandate. The question, Mr. Chairman, is what does that mean? Both the phrase and the definition are so ambiguous that it will be impossible for the CBO to implement. I support the gentleman's amendment to strike this language from the bill, and with that, I yield back. Thank you. Do any other members wish to be able to speak to this amendment? Let me make a comment about that. Mr. Connolly and I have had conversations. We also were contacted by CBO, and uh, I, we have had a, a couple of conversations about this already, which I think are very reasonable. I think CBO's uh, conversation was very reasonable in that. Uh, in a letter that they have sent to us as a follow-up and communications that we have had with them, they already track some of these indirect costs currently in their cost estimates. 
Uh, the challenge they have is how to define this. Does the definition really work? Uh, is it clear enough? Uh, so I do have some of those same concerns after, after chatting back and forth through staff with CBO, and, uh, and I would be supportive of us reworking the language. Uh, because CBO already includes some of these indirect costs uh, in some of their um, cost estimates, uh, I would not be supportive of trying to strike all of that because it is already included. It is a matter of separating it and what that really means. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, I would certainly leave it up to Ranking Men Member Connolly, but I, I want us, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I'm always concerned about. You, if you've been around here a few years, you realize that sometimes uh, when things are ambiguous, they, 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 you have a tendency not the legislation in many instances is not carried out the way the Congress mm -hmm. intended it to be carried out, and the next thing you got a new Congress. And then you're revisiting the issue ten years from now. So whatever, <clears throat> what, however, we my aim, and I'm sure the ranking member's aim is to uh, be effective and efficient in whatever we do. We can spend, we can sit here for the next thirty days talking about this and not achieving the things we want to achieve. So it, it's that that is putting politics aside, trying to be effective and efficient, and trying to carry out our goals. And so. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would yield to Mr. Connolly in the hope that we could work this out some kind of way. Yeah, and I, I would definitely concur with that and would want this language to be the most clear it can possibly be. I think that is part of the concern uh, that CBO expressed to us that the original definition of direct costs from the UMRA legislation in 1995 was not clear enough for them to form it. Uh, this is trying to clarify and to clean up uh, some of that from 1995 and to make it as clear as we possibly can. And uh, so we don't want to make it even more vague in, in the process of that. So I would definitely agree with that. Mr. Connolly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you have a proposal? I do. I would propose that we uh, communicate back and forth in a bipartisan way with CBO and try to be a work out good language on this and to see if either what we are looking for can be included in the definition of direct costs or just be able to get a good definition of what they are already accomplishing, to be able to put that into the legislation or to be able to clearly articulate that. If we can't clearly articulate that, then it is not going to help CBO and it is going to create, as ironic as it is, an unfunded mandate on them. Uh, to be able to try to help accomplish something through additional staffing and through additional needs they have over there, which we don't need to add at this point. Uh, so I would, I would uh, propose that we put a letter to them and have some communication in a bipartisan way to work, be able to work this language out and be able to bring it to the full committee at, at the uh, next time this comes up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I very much appreciate the bipartisan spirit and the uh, uh, common sense approach you are taking, and I have taken the liberty actually of anticipating this and drafting a very simple letter to Mr. Elmendorf and be glad to share with you now. However, I would like the assurance that this bill will not come before the full committee for markup until we have resolved this issue. When, you know, you, we may disagree, right. but I don't want us in the position of agreeing to withdraw an amendment here and then find ourselves marking up at full committee level with the issue, as Mr. Cummings indicated, still unresolved. Correct. You know, I, w I would absolutely I would give my word. We are going to work together on that and be able to find some resolution to work at both on the staff level and on the member level and try to get this worked out. Your word is always right. good enough for me, Mr. I'll Chairman. Here, this is a simple letter, um, and I would hope that you and I could sign it and get it off to Mr. Elmendorf today. Well, you already have my name on it. How polite of you. <laughs> we, we thought you would have no objection, but we'll <laughs> With your assurance, Mr. Chairman, I would withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Are there other amendments that are coming? Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I don't have an amendment, but I'd like to uh, speak on the bill, speak on the substitute amendment. To speak on the ANS? Uh, speak on the, the underlying the underlying. Ab absolutely, you may speak on the, on the underlying uh, bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I appreciate your willingness to work with the ranking member on the uh, issue of reasonably foreseeable indirect costs. Uh, I think you are engaging most likely in uh, a Herculean endeavor uh, to try to find some definition uh, of that term. Uh, I uh, think we would all love to be able <clears throat> to understand all of the indirect costs of everything we do, but to ask uh, an agency uh, of this Congress, which is already overburdened to do that, I think, is likely to be impossible, but I appreciate the dialogue you're going to undertake. I just wanted to put uh, some concerns on the record uh, regarding Section 11 of this uh, bill. I certainly understand, I think, what the intent of Section 11 is uh, to get increased stakeholder participation 
um, in the setting of regulations. But uh, I don't meet many of my constituents out there who worry about uh, whether or not industry has a seat at the table uh, when regulations are being set in Washington. Uh, frankly, uh, industry has uh, legions of lobbyists, whether it be the banks, the oil companies, the insurance companies. Um, the problem that my constituents see is not whether industry has a seat at the table, but whether regular, ordinary, everyday people have a seat at the table uh, and whether their interests are being uh, represented. Uh, I'm all for increased participation from every potential affected party when a regulation is coming through the system. But uh, I would hope, if this legislation is to move forward, that what we are getting at is not just an increased forum for industry to help agencies write regulations. I think, frankly, uh, that happens, according to folks I represent all too often, that we uh, are setting up a process by which, regulation, by which regulation setters and makers are going out into the public, going out into the communities that are affected at the ground level by these regulations, perhaps are being protected by the regulations, not just uh, being the target of the regulations, uh, to have uh, real public input in uh, this process. And it's hard for me to understand the uh, true intent of this legislation, um, but that is the concern uh, that, frankly, is given to me um, back home, uh, not necessarily wanting us to come here and give more forums for industry. Uh, they want more forums for their views to be represented before, uh, before agencies and before uh, this government. With Jim O'Neill. Absolutely. The, that, that section of it puts us into line where city, county, and states already have an opportunity to be able to say, here are the issues we are going to bump up against beyond just the uh, review and comment format. And it allows companies that are affected directly to be able to also have that same privilege to say, here is what that looks like, dealing with least costly options. There are other options on the table to give them plenty of opportunity. If this is going to affect, at this point, over $100 million worth of impact on our economy, it at least allows the people that it will affect first to be able to have that opportunity. Now, there is this, as you know well, the UMRA is an informational piece. It doesn't prohibit anything. It provides information to the regulators. It provides inf information to the legislators at the end of the day. This provides maximum amount of impact to all parties that are affected on that. So I agree on it. I'm not looking for any kind of special interest, anyone, uh, to be able to have it. I'm looking for it to be consistent, whether the non-Federal party is what, how it's written in the UMRA legislation, whether that non-Federal party is a county that's affected or whether that's a company that's affected or a group of companies, small or large. Let me, then let me just ask a follow-up question. When we talk about affected parties, let's say we were talking about a workplace safety regulation. Clearly, I think the intent is that for one of the affected parties to be the employer, um, but would one of the affected parties also be the workers? Well, they should be well represented in that as well. But if, if there is unfunded mandates coming down, that regulation is being able to create it for workplace safety. Obviously, that has risen up through there is a need for that. But if there are four different options to be able to resolve the same problem, there should be people being able to lay out four different options rather than a regulator that may or may not know four different options to be able to talk through the process. But, but just to clarify, under the definition, impacted parties within the private sector, does that include, in that example, would that include a requirement that the workers, as a, as a party within the private sector, be consulted in the rulemaking? OSHA, for example. Right. An OSHA, an OSHA regulation, right. uh, would they be required uh, under this section to consult with both the workers as a party impacted? Um, in the private sector or s just with the employers? You might have to get some clarification on that. I know in the review and comment period that is included as well. Uh, this is simply trying to state what are the different options that are possibilities that are out there. I would assume that when they are talking with uh, any type of industry, they are also going to be chatting with folks that are impacted within that industry as well. I appreciate the answer. I, I think it is imperative as we move this bill forward that this not be simply a requirement that the uh, business be consulted, but if we are going to have all parties within the private sector have a seat at the table, that uh, those parties that may be uh, receiving the protection also have representation as well. And uh, I yield back. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. If I, just, if I might just have one point of clarification on, uh, com on the comments uh, between you and uh, my colleague, Mr. Murphy. Um, I continue to believe, as someone who spent 14 years in local government, there is a world of difference between an unfunded mandate by the Federal Government on a State and local government that has a similar function and mission in the public sector than it is to treat that as the same 
when we have a regulation proposed on the private sector. A polluter being required to clean up his or her pollution is in a totally different can category than an unfunded mandate to do something in education on a local government. And this bill treats them the same, and that is, in my view, totally uh, overturning the real intent of UMRA. And so uh, I understand the agenda in trying to equate the two, but I just want to go on the record as, as rejecting that equation, and, um, and uh, it's yet another reason why, to Mr. Murphy, I would say I would hope this bill would not go forward. I understand the original UMRA piece, as you know well, uh, included all non-Federal parties, including the private sector. So this is not an expansion in that area. It is an expansion to, to say when we do input from each area, uh, as we do with a city, county, or state, we should also do with industry when we begin to deal with any kind of regulatory change on it uh, to allow people to have input for informational purposes only on that. With that, are there other amendments or comments to the bill? We are prepared to vote. If there are no further discussion, the question on the amendment and the nature of a substitute, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Do I have a voice vote here? All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are going to ask for a okay. recorded vote on okay. all right. passing. All right. Here we go. With on, on, on passing this out. Wait a second, if you are going to vote, I will go record a vote on the other one. Yes. That is correct, yeah. I move the Subcommittee on Technology, Information Policy, and Intergovernmental Relations and Procurement Reform Report, H.R. 373, to the full committee uh, with, as recommended, the bill do pass as amended. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 373 to the full committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the Chair, the Mr. ayes Mr. Have... Chairman? Yes, sir. I would ask for a recorded vote. Ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Mr. Langford. Aye. Mr. Langford votes aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Labrador. Aye. Mr. Labrador votes aye. Mr. Meehan. Aye. Mr. Meehan votes aye. Mr. Connolly. No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Murphy. No. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Ms. Spear? Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Chairman, I would ask the clerk to give us the tally. I would like to ask the, the clerk to hold. We have a member that's walking through the door right now. Mr. Chairman, could I inquire whether this member walking through the door is, in fact, in the door? Sure, you can inquire. Could I ask, while we are waiting for the member to slow walk through the door, um, is it the Chairman's understanding that uh, in, a in the event of a tie vote, the motion fails? Uh, that is correct. And although we have delayed the tally, an informal tally on our side says at the moment we are at 4-4. Four, four. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Uh, at the moment we are. Ah, here is your fifth vote. No. You are not recorded, sir. Aye. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye.
on that. Would, would you like to uh, report that telling now? Yes, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I would. <laughs> on that vote, sir, we have five ayes, four noes. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. H.R. 373 is ordered to report to the full committee. Mr. Chairman, before you uh, strike the gavel, with respect to your last remark, with the understanding, however, that we are going to try to work out this indirect cost thing before we bring it to full committee. Absolutely. Thank right. you so much. Absolutely, we are. With that, with the committee stands adjourned for business. Okay. waves an okay. But watch what happens next.